Hey guys, what's going on? It's CC Garland here, back with another video. Today, I'm going to go over the advantages and disadvantages of hometown wholesaling versus virtual wholesaling. Guys, so we're on the same page here. Hometown wholesaling is essentially wholesaling in your backyard, your hometown, or the current physical location where you are currently at. Compare this to virtual wholesaling, and you are basically virtually marketing to sellers and you're locking up properties sight unseen. And then you may have somebody that goes out and views the properties and take pictures for you, but you physically are not driving or flying to that city to get that property under contract and do the deal, right? You're doing all of your negotiations over the phone. So guys, each one has its own unique advantages and disadvantages, pros and cons. I'm gonna share with you guys with my over nine years of experience in this industry, as of the date of this recording, uh, the, the advantages I've seen with both and where I think you should be leaning towards depending on where you're at in your career, because one, uh, and I'll just tell you this virtually wholesaling, it can be a little bit challenging if you're a new wholesaler. However, when you're hometown wholesaling, you could tend to get stuck into just wanting to do this because it's comfortable and you end up being in a, a market that's actually not uh, good for you or stagnant or you're getting priced out of the market. So let's go ahead and get into this, guys. The advantages of hometown wholesale. I went ahead and listed five here for you guys. So let's start off with comfortable and familiarity. So what do I mean by this, guys? You could tend to actually take more risk if you are starting your wholesaling journey, especially if you're new. Uh, and you're not really sure about this whole wholesaling business model and if it's for you, okay? It could be very comforting actually taking this risk in your backyard versus doing it states away and countries away. You can have people you can lean on for, uh, for advice. And guys, this might be an area you grew up in. So you might know the best areas that are uh, fit for wholesaling in and just generally good parts of town versus war zones to stay away from, okay? In addition to taking more risk, guys, you can put yourself in a situation where you might already have existing relationships in these markets that you can leverage, which leads me to my next point. So you can get potential referrals from friends um, or people in your neighborhood. Let's just say you grew up in your neighborhood and you know of a few older people looking to sell or a few people that got um, their houses deeded to them as inherited properties. You can use those friendships and leverage those friendships to get your first deal. And I know many wholesalers that have done this, okay? Uh, you can leverage your friends and family for funding for your marketing or business operations as well. So guys, somebody who may uh, invest in your business, it may be a family member, but they may be more prone to invest in it if, it if they can actually tangibly see what you're doing or it's something you're doing in your hometown and they grew up in that area too and they're familiar with it, right? They may not see it as just an online business, especially if you're doing direct mail. Uh, direct mail, they can physically see the mail pieces that you're sending out to homeowners, right? And that can make the business seem even more legitimate. Now, these are paradigms that I don't live in, guys, but just understanding how people who aren't in the industry operates and where their mind is, uh, if you're trying to get people on board, it might be easier to rally people around your cause if you're doing it physically. Uh, and then they may think you're a realtor, right? You never want to market yourself as a realtor, but just go with it. <laughs> if they think that's the case, if, if they'll fund your marketing operations, okay? Uh, also too, guys, I would say tread lightly here, but in the same point I just mentioned with it viewing, it seeming like you have a, a legitimate um, physical operation uh, because you're working from your hometown that all your friends are living in, our family members, they may be uh, more on board with coming to help you with uh, as employees or potentially becoming business partners. Now, I would say mixing friends and businesses is not the best thing, but they can temporarily help you with some things here. Uh, I know I personally recruited my sister to cold call for me. Um, I started my first company, Holy City Homes in Charleston with my best friend. Uh, we grew up in church. We were in youth group together. So it can work out, but I do think those things do have their own expiration date. Another advantage with wholesaling in your hometown is that you can build rapport a lot quicker through face-to-face -face interactions. 
right? So you can meet with brokers uh, who can, you can also send retail leads to. Let's just say you get a whole bunch of leads from your marketing or your direct mail, your cold calling, your texting, et cetera. And these leads are just unqualified. You know, let's just say you targeted an area that's affluent, that's on a golf course, and those will make great properties for listings, but those individuals have no business really being on your wholesaling. So you can sort out something where you can send them every lead and they can pay you per lead, okay? You could do that. Also guys, you can have brokers that may take a chance on you and actually list deals for you on the MLS. It's a lot easier having that conversation over a glass of wine, you know, or your beer of choice at happy hour than on the phone with somebody you never met. And I mean, you met online, okay? So that barrier to entry as far as building rapport is a lot lower in your hometown, okay? Guys, the same thing with these realtors and brokers with meeting up with them, the same thing applies to cash buyers. Uh, you can vet cash buyers a lot easier and you can know if they're about it, meaning, if they meet up and they're at the meeting, you know, let's just say you set up a, a lunch meeting and they're there before uh, you get there and they're, they were 10, 20 minutes early, you know that they're the real deal. If you say, hey, meet me at this property that I don't have under contract yet, and they and you say, hey, pose as a contractor, and they do that, and then after you finish walking through the property with them, they say, hey, I'll give you whatever you want for the property, or hey, you know, if you told them 60K and they said, that's great, and you have a $20,000 spread there, you basically locked up that property with that buyer there without, you know, you may not even have it under contract. So I've done this before where I brought trusted cash buyers to properties to basically either vet the home for me beforehand or um, also uh, potentially buy the property if I wasn't sure if I was getting under contract at the right price, I would let them go see it first and then they would tell me, hey, if it was priced right. Most likely, if they passed on a deal and I trust them as a cash buyer, I most likely have the deal too high. If they give me a counter offer, and they're like, yeah, CC, this property is way too expensive. Um, you know, you need to knock it down to like 40K. I'm not going to push it out to a whole bunch of other cash buyers because I trust their opinion, right? I may want to get some other opinions, but usually um, if, if it's somebody you trust and they've been in their game for a little bit, you can trust that they know what they're talking about. And then I'll just go renegotiate with the seller. So those types of things I've done before uh, with cash buyers, and they've really, I've only been able to do that in areas where I physically was located. And uh, if you guys aren't familiar with my backstory, I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, and that's where I actually got my start with wholesaling before I started going virtual. Also, guys, you have access to way more support meaning meetups, RIAs, or mentors who will potentially invest time into you. They may not be somebody who walks you through your first deal or anything like that, but hey, you may establish a relationship with them over time. They may take a liking to you, and then they may just walk you through uh, some things that you get stuck on or potentially walk you through your first deal. You never know. So uh, having a support group was really beneficial for me when I first started. Now, while I did grow up in my my market I was in was in Charleston. I attended the Fayetteville RIA in North Carolina because I was working there at the time, but I was going back and forth between Fayetteville and Charleston like twice a month. So Fayetteville was only temporarily uh, my, my physical location for about a year, but my actual physical place I was, I was, I was really living after I quit my job and did wholesaling full-time. It was in Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. So uh, I had, I, I then, you know, at the same time, it was awesome because I was establishing a meetup uh, network and uh, and a group of like mentors and like-minded people in Charleston, in addition to Fayetteville, even though I wasn't marketing in Fayetteville at the time. Okay, another advantage is that it's way easier to negotiate with sellers at the property if you're doing this yourself, right? You can get somebody to do this on behalf of yourself, but vetting and finding that person is like very difficult finding somebody that you trust to negotiate for you without them wanting half of the deal, okay? So, um, and if you're a new wholesaler, you can pretty much forget it, you know? So when you're when you're very new at this, it's really to your advantage if you're doing it in your hometown to go to the property and negotiate with the seller, view it, and then get them down on price. It's much easier to get a price reduction in a face-to-face -face meeting than if you are virtual unless you inherently are just good at sales, 
or you put in the reps, right? You've done hundreds of appointments physically or over the phone. Um, it's a muscle like anything you have to learn and um, you, have to, you have to grow it over time through repetition. Uh, you can also guys set up same day appointments with sellers. Uh, you can set up these impromptu meetings. Let's just say a hot lead comes in at nine o'clock in the morning, okay? Guys, I could be out to that property by noon versus doing that if I'm virtual and I have a boots on the ground person and they may be doing their own thing. They may be at work. They may be running their own business. Like the likelihood I'm able to just pick up and go to that property um, is not as likely, especially if I want to respect somebody else's time. And on top of that, guys, if your boots on the ground person is just chilling around waiting for you to call them, like, are they not working? Like, are you not doing DoorDash or anything? <laughs> you know, so, like, are you not doing your own thing? So, if they're just sitting there waiting for me to uh, send them things, can I really trust them to go out to the property because they might not even have anything going on themselves? So, that doesn't give me very much confidence in that boots on the ground person. But to get to back to this point here, it's uh, just really a lot easier to negotiate with sellers at the property and get price reductions. I've gotten 20, 30, 40% price reduction dollar values from uh, 200k I, i've gotten sellers all the way down to 100k i've gotten sellers down from 300k to 200k with in-person negotiation so um, that's a real advantage of, of doing wholesaling in your hometown as well one is the, one of the bigger advantages and more tangible also two guys it, it's having more control over the overall process what do i mean by this Guys, you can visit attorney offices and prompt to our title companies. I know one thing that I always did was uh, once a month, I would just go and visit my attorney, attorney chard, and we would just sit there and eat lunch together. Or I would just drive by, check on the properties myself or the, uh, the properties I had under contract. I could have emailed, but let's just say I was checking out a property and I was in town. I was in North Charleston. It didn't hurt me to go by. And then uh, what really helps is the the attorney... I mean, they offer uh, not only uh, are you checking the status of your closings, but once you get buddy buddy with your attorney, you're basically getting free consultation at that point. Um, and I know for me, when I first started, I was giving my attorney a lot of business and wholesale deals. I was keeping them very busy and I was recommending some really big buyers to them. So every deal we had to use our closing attorney, attorney charge. Okay. So I was bringing some buyers over to them. They were using um, Weeks and Irvine and some other Butler and College, some more conventional closing attorneys that weren't really well versed in investing lingo, terminology, and how to do more creative financing deals. They, they basically work with realtors. But when I introduced them to Chard, they were like, man, we're going to close up all of our deals with this guy. <laughs> and so he thanked me for that by basically taking me underneath his wing. Now, I didn't take advantage of his time or anything. You know, I was judicious about when I showed up. I didn't, you know, go over there every day and blow up his office, but I learned a lot about the business by just being a fly on the wall and being humble too. So uh, those were really good times, 2015, 16, 17. Those were my very, um, you know, formative years in the real estate investing industries, particularly with wholesaling. I learned a lot about um, deeds, how to, how to read deeds, how to pull title, uh, what title searches were how to handle probate issues, how to petition newspapers and stuff to make sure there's no other, um, nobody's going to express interest in uh, in the property before we transfer the deed to the executor, all sorts of things, right? So uh, these, this is just something that's invaluable with being in uh, that physical location, okay? Uh, researching deeds and filing memorandums as well. So it's a lot easier doing this uh, in person. Guys, I know some counties and cities could be very, very difficult when uh, filing this type of paperwork. So you may have to go back and to the seller, maybe like, I know I did this like four times for one seller just to get the deed filed and, in Charleston, South Carolina. And literally I had to take the notary out to the seller like four or five times because the county kept on kicking it back, my paperwork back because there were, there were like, Guys, it was it was really silly. There were like small things missing or on the paperwork as far as the language or the language was wrong, um, little things. So instead of paying somebody 
who's going to do that each time, they may charge you $100 each time you go up to there, to that property. Or maybe you may not even file a memorandum because um, you don't know how to do the process. So basically you can, you know, I, I'd say this lightly, you could waste your time more than somebody else's time. You could fumble through the process, right? You don't have to have all your ducks in a row when you do this yourself, okay? Also guys, this goes along the lines with the previous point I was making. Uh, you're cutting out fewer fees or percentages to JV partners, realtors or home inspectors. Say you're, um, you could go out to the property yourself. You could take pictures yourself when you get it under contract. Um, you can move the property to your buyers yourself. You don't have to bring all these partners on board and cut percentages in. So, um, so this is something I want you guys to keep in mind when it comes to, uh, you know, wholesaling at, in your backyard. This is something that allowed me to scale my business because I wasn't cutting out a whole bunch of percentages off the rip. Guys, you could be your own boots on the ground person and inspector. I just said that. Uh, but, you know, to drive this point home further is that you can pick up and just go to the house at any time. You don't have to coordinate between the cash buyer, the tenant, the, um, you know, your boots on the ground person, three parties at once, and then make sure they're not all talking to each other <laughs> and discussing the deal and the nuances of the deal behind your back when you're not there. That could be very stressful. So uh, you just have more control over the deal and the process. So those are a lot of the advantages that I would say, really big advantages that I've seen over my nine years of doing this. Guys, let's talk about some of the disadvantages, okay? Some of the disadvantages could be this. You have a finite number of sellers to target. What do I mean by that, guys? So there's only a small segment of sellers worth marketing to, right? Only a small segment of homeowners that fit our criteria. We're not going to be targeting owner occupants who bought their houses in the last five years, in like 2018, 19, 20, 21, and 22. Those people don't really have any motivation. Guys, we're not doing creative financing here. We're looking for wholesale deals, okay? So those people aren't going to have enough equity, most likely, not enough motivation, and they probably bought their houses for much more than our typical demographic bought their houses for. We're buying houses from people, guys, that most likely bought their houses for under 100K, maybe 150K or less. I know that I only target homeowners who bought their houses for less than 100,000. So with that being said, we're targeting like five to 10% of the homeowners. Now, in your market, that may be 30,000 homeowners, maybe 50,000. In some markets, it may only be 5,000. So what can end up happening is you could end up targeting the same owners over and over again, right? And because of this, you can be um, in a position where you're, you're not pulling unique records, you're not targeting fresh data, you're, tar you're texting people over and over again that you already texted before because there's no, if you end up changing your criteria, you're targeting people on the golf course, um, on golf courses rather, in uh, maybe beachfront properties. I know in Charleston, that was an issue or rural areas. So you may just be expanding your ideal list just for the sake of, of, of targeting homeowners in that market. Okay, I've done this before a lot of times before I wisen up. Also too, guys, you could be in a situation where if you're there and you're just bit on staying in that current market, you might, Say, okay, well, let me just target homeowners with direct mail, radio ads. You may be getting in bidding wars with PPC. It may start costing you $350, $500, $700 for one lead that may not even be hot. Okay, guys, you can end up targeting, I just said this, the same demographic um, in, a, in a different market, but yielding fresh leads for lower cost. So what do I mean by that? Instead of Expanding your cold calling and text messaging, which I think is the most cost effective and best way to reach homeowners right now. Instead of not doing that because you targeted those homeowners over and over again and doing direct mail, radio ads, or PPC, which may be more costly, you can just take that same demographic and go to a different market. Okay. Uh, so this is something to keep in mind whenever you are 
wholesaling in your hometown, okay? I've also seen investors who have closed well over 20 deals, sometimes close to 30 or 40 deals, and they don't know the first things about running a business, okay? What do I mean by that? They lack expertise when hiring because they've just done everything themselves. Guys, they, they're overworking themselves. It's not a matter of if they're going to get burned out, but when. They end up putting so much on themselves that the business doesn't move unless they do. So really, they can't take any days off. And what happens is once work starts piling up, they may forget to view HUDs. They may forget the little details. They may be having a CRM issue that they spent the whole week analyzing or fixing. And during that process, they forgot to check their emails. No marketing is done. Buyers aren't being contacted. Okay. Deals aren't getting done. You know, it gets to a point, guys, where you can't do everything yourself. And I've seen a lot of people that just wholesale in their hometown and their physical location, they're not required to develop these systems because they could simply just go to a property in their backyard. Oh, that house is five minutes away from my office. Oh, we'll just check it out. Oh, I, that house is 10 minutes away from me. I'll check it out. Oh, I could go to the county and just pull tax delinquent records and not develop a system around it. You see where I'm getting at here, guys? You do all this stuff, and then the more and more you do it, the more and more you think that you're the only one that can do it and all the knowledge is in your head. And when you bring somebody on, you may lack patience because they don't understand the job because you've been doing it yourself for three, four, five years, et cetera. Okay? Guys, investing in non-scalable marketing channels like driving for dollars or bandit size. I see a lot of people do this and they think it, it will work continuously. But the thing is, they are trading their time for money at that point. And while this may be well and good when you get first get started, it's very difficult scaling these marketing channels. And then on top of that, like with direct mail, radio ads, and PPC, you can do cold calling and texting for a lot cheaper. And you can reach more people, and you could just vet the, cold, vet the leads when they come in for cold, warm, or hot motivation, right? Rather than you going out on a Saturday hanging bandit signs or doing driving for dollars. Guys, we got to work smarter, not harder. A lot of people, they get addicted to the grind. And they may say, well, what am I supposed to do if I'm not doing these things? That's not the right question. It's figuring out what you're supposed to do as a business owner. Okay. And a lot of that really comes from thinking about the rep repetitive tasks that you're doing over and over again and asking yourself, hey, can I create systems and processes out of these things? Okay. Can I hand this off to somebody else? If I do one task the same way 90% of the time, can I hand this off to a virtual assistant? Can I hire a friend or family member to do this task for me so I can start focusing on the 30,000 level um, task in my business, the $10,000 hour task in my business, okay? Meeting cash buyers, networking with realtors and brokers, um, you know, even communicating with uh, homeowners and your sellers if they go ghost on you, right? really smoothing deals over that's where a lot of the business owners i know that have their systems uh, and processes created they deal with those types of things like the really heavy problem solving um, qualifying cash buyers things of that nature okay guys also too um, and this will be the this will be true for most people i think watching this um, because i think most people are living in areas that they're not going to be necessarily, they're going to be living in areas that they're not marketing to. So they're going to be living in a nicer part of town like the suburbs. And they may be part of a larger MSA, but their immediate radius around them, 30 minute or 30 mile radius, may be um, affluent, right? And so the whole MSA they may be living in is affluent. So they may be in a smaller market. And smaller markets, guys, usually have a few dominant investors and wholesalers and they may be outspending everybody else and there may be very few neighborhoods that you could go into um, easily. I know in Charleston, South Carolina, I got lucky because I was able to market to a uh, an area called Union Heights in North Charleston that was basically, it was like drug infested to be honest, but we had a bar that really wanted to turn the area around so we wholesaled 
most of the land to this one buyer. And they held onto those lots for like, I would say three years, and then they start developing on, on those lots, okay? We got lucky, but we ended up going to an area where no other wholesaler wanted to be in, none of the big investors. And we had to put in sweat equity. There's other things I did, like I got a property in one of the most prestigious areas in Charleston, downtown Charleston, 29403, but that was a pre-foreclosure. I had to do a lot of work to get that deal done, okay? A lot of sweat equity. I had to help the seller um, move her belongings out of the house and just, it was a it was a difficult deal to get done. But it could be done. But you have more opportunity in bigger markets and most likely your market that you're in right now is too small to wholesale. Guys, we also have situations where people are too familiar and comfortable in their current market. So while this could be a, an advantage, it can be a disadvantage as well. Why do I say this? You could end up making decisions based off of hunches. Like, well, I just heard um, that this part of town's good and it's turning around. The people at my church said I should go there. Right? Even the people at Urea, you know, you guys can end up being caught in sort of the hive mind mentality and the echo chamber where one person is doing something and everybody's doing it. Like, oh, the big realtor in town, like in Charleston, Jeff Cook was a big up and coming realtor and everybody was riding him. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to say the language, but they were, they were riding him um, a lot. And so they were going off of what he was doing and they weren't doing things for themselves. Um, it was all just to like keep up with the Joneses. And that's, that's, that's not right. You need to go off of data guys and you need to know when to jump ship. You need to know when, okay. The market you're in may not be great for wholesaling anymore because I do think each market has its time of day. I think when it time for a market to turn around, you have about five good years to be in that market before it becomes too affluent and it does not make sense for wholesalers to be there. Okay, so please keep that in mind. So let's go ahead and talk about the virtual wholesaling. When it comes to virtual wholesaling, guys, we have millions of homeowners we could potentially market to across all 50 states. Now, I will say uh, there are only maybe 20 states that make sense to wholesale in. Um, definitely not Illinois or Oklahoma because they have rules and regulations surrounding wholesaling and more might come through in a pipeline. But just out of common sense, Alaska. People do wholesale in Hawaii, but I've seen more people do creative financing there. Uh, but, you know, the the contiguous United States makes more sense than in Alaska or Hawaii. OK, so just because we have 50 states doesn't mean you can pick up and go to Utah and it'll be a great way to mark a great place to market. Um, there are some markets that really don't make sense to wholesale. You can wholesale anywhere, but, you know, why are you going to make it more difficult on yourself when you have the whole country at your disposal, essentially? Okay, we have 400 million people roughly living in the United States. That's a lot of people, guys, and that's a heck of a lot of housing. So don't limit yourself just to your back. Also, too, guys, when we're targeting more markets or bigger markets, we could end up being more targeted with the homeowners we're going after, meaning I could be going after homeowners that um, bought their houses for underneath 100000 absentee and out of state. That made take me 10 markets if I want to get a list of 10,000 sellers, but I can do that. If I were to do that in one market, albeit a small market too, like Charleston, South Carolina, I may have like 40 or 100 homeowners that fit that criteria. And that's just not enough to target um, over the course of a month, let alone a week. That would probably get me one day of texting and cold calls. Okay, so you have more homeowners that you can target without sacrificing your ideal demographic and avatar. Okay. Guys, another thing too is we can easily switch the market if it becomes too affluent or unaffordable, right? Because we're not emotionally invested in this virtual market, we could simply just say, you know what? The median prices in this area are becoming way too high. I'm just going to take my business elsewhere. All right. I'm not going to sit here and compete against all these new wholesalers. Now I may be competing against realtors 
for $500,000 houses, and the sellers are very uncooperative. Okay, so a couple of things you guys need to realize is that you need to leave the ship before it starts sinking, right? You can stay on it when it's sinking, but leave it before it's sunk. Don't go down with the sinking ship, you know? Bury your ego here. If you see that most of the neighborhoods are gentrified, like over 80% of them are gentrified, it's time to move on. There's some things that you can hear in sellers' voices. If sellers, that you're that same demographic of sellers you were targeting a year ago in one market, let's just say you were in Tampa, and the sellers were very cooperative, they didn't ask you for your website, they didn't ask you, can I see your contract? last year and then this year all of a sudden you're targeting the same demographic they bought their houses for underneath a hundred thousand they're absentee and let's just say they're abs they're out of state as well and they're asking you now let me see your contract well property values are deep are, are increasing they built a whole foods down for my house they built top golf down for my house they're building a walking park you know they have this great idea to build all these breweries and bars and clubs right down from my area i'm going to hold out guys once you start hearing that from maybe not one or two whole, uh, homeowners, but pretty much all of your homeowners, guys, it's time to bounce and go somewhere else. That's a warning sign. <laughs> uh, let the realtors have those homeowners at that point. At that point, you know their distressed properties may have gone for $80,000 a year or two years ago, but now they may be going for $200,000. Guys, there are some areas in Charleston where I grew up in and when I first started doing wholesaling, I've seen homes that were going for probably $20,000, $30,000. They couldn't even sell in 2015. They let those same homes sit there and they let the whole neighborhood around them gentrify. And those same homes are going for $200,000. The homeowners haven't done anything to the houses. If anything, they look in worse condition than they were in 2015. So one thing to realize, guys, is don't listen to the crowd. Don't listen to the hype. Um, as investors, as wholesalers, we're looking for something completely different in the market than realtors. If you start talking to me and say, well, they built Top Golf in this area. They have this coming to the area. They have that coming to the area. Guys, what? You know, if, if that's happening in a year or two or maybe three years even, the, the homeowners already know this too, if you know this, and they're going to hold out. And it's just going to be difficult. We're, we're not, we don't make money, guys, by focusing on homeowners that are, that might be sitting on a golden goose. You may think just because the market has significantly turned around, you can find somebody who bought 30, bought their house for 30,000. Now it's worth 200,000 and you can make a hundred thousand dollar assignment fee. Yeah, you could, guys. But that same homeowner is not looking for, $30,000 for their house. They're going to be looking for probably two, three, four, I mean, 10 times as much for that house. Okay. Unless they inherited it and they don't, they don't know what it's worth at that case. In that case, you're, you know, ethically, you might be taking advantage of them. All right. So you need to ask yourself that. And if you're comfortable with that. So you know, you you don't want to go somewhere and potentially get lucky or hope you're hitting the lottery. Okay. Um, that's not what we're doing. And that's not how we build sustainable businesses over time. Yes, guys, you will get lucky. Um, in my first three years, I landed a $40,000 wholesale deal. I said, oh man, that's nice. I got excited, but I knew that wasn't the norm. I knew that was just, um, I knew that was just, you know, one in a million, you know, probably one in a thousand sellers, guys. But I wasn't going to say, okay, well, just because I landed that $40,000 deal, let me focus solely on that particular zip code or neighborhood that got me that deal. I just knew all the cards aligned. The seller was in emotional distress. The timing was perfect. And really what you do if you want those types of deals, you just have to do more marketing to give yourself more of a fighting chance. Okay? Guys, you also have more cash buyers at your disposal. So rather than having just the buyers that everybody knows in your backyard, you can have twice as many buyers, three times as many buyers. And what's better too is that a lot of these buyers, um, especially if you go virtually after you've done your first couple of deals in your backyard, you have your stuff together at that point. And you may have messed up with a few buyers and fumbled around on some deals. 
and the initial buyers in your hometown may have seen your flaws. And then when you try to increase your assignment fees, they may be reluctant to do that because they would they would say, well, I, I remember when you first started CC, and they may be looking at you like still like you're a novice and you may be three, four years in the game. So um, you basically are starting fresh with more buyers uh, in larger markets. If you're targeting more areas, you're going to have more buyers that you can have at your fingertips. You're not just limited to um, to your hometown, right? The same way that we have million of, millions of homeowners we can market to, we have hundreds, if not thousands of cash buyers that we can market to, okay? Also, you can do this from anywhere in the country or world. Guys, very important. I know um, from personal experience, I've mentored and consulted uh, a Canadian investor and an Australian investor who are still both actively wholesale. And I worked with them a few years back, got them going in their businesses. They're still going strong, okay? Every position can be outsourced as well, including acquisitions and transaction coordinators. Now, guys, this isn't as easy as it seems. It takes time, repetition, and yes, falling on your face sometimes. It takes you losing out on deals. It takes you having deals blowing, blowing up in your face to know what not to do or what to do on the next deal. You really have to have your processes tight. Guys, um, you can often command larger assignments. So, you know, if you're in a smaller city, uh, your assignment fees may be stuck at a particular price. They may be stuck at like 10K or 5K, right? Outside of that market, significantly increasing in its sales prices which will also increase the competition in that market too. And the homeowners you could target, you know, are, are have, you have more competition over those leads. That can increase your assignments, but, but you have to wait for time to catch up, right? What if you say, okay, I want to get $40,000 assignments. now? You can easily go to another market where you can target homeowners where the prices of their houses are more and you can potentially have larger spreads. Okay, if you're limited in your hometown, you might be trying to make something shape that just isn't going to work. So that's something that you really need to keep in mind. Also, guys, if you can do this in one city, you can do this in pretty much every other city in the country. If you master virtual wholesaling in one city, guys, the process is the same. Okay, the key components, you're going to need a closing attorney or title company. You're going to need a handful, maybe five or 10 serious buyers. You need to list about 5,000 to 10,000 apps to your sellers you're cold calling or texting every single month, okay? And um, this will yield one to three contracts with unique records. You want to have a market that's large enough that you can target more homeowners and enough unique homeowners every single month to get one to three contracts in 30 days. Okay, I'll say that again. You need to have a market that is large enough Okay, that you can target at least 5,000 to 10,000 unique homeowners every single month, meaning a fresh crop of new homeowners. And that should get you one to three properties under contract. You may get um, about 30 to 50 leads out of there. Does that mean you throw away the other um, you know, 25 to 30 leads? No, you market to them over time. But I'm saying to get a property under contract in your in your first go around of marketing or every time you do marketing, you need to be marketing um, uh, to a fresh list of absentee homeowners, at least 5,000. I can't overemphasize. Also guys, you need a trusted boots on the ground person or home inspector. Guys, once you have these components, it's done. You need to establish these in every market and you're good to go. Now I oversimplified that. I don't want you guys thinking that this is too easy. But um, guys, you, you also need to realize that many of the objections and problems are the same in every market. So you're going to be dealing with tenants being difficult when scheduling property inspections. I dealt with that literally this week where um, all right, we sent a buyer over to a property and <laughs> the tenants were in the house and they wouldn't let the buyer in. You could clearly, the buyer was like, hey, I can hear them. <laughs> and they wouldn't open the door. So that's something that I deal with even to this day after nine years of being in the business. Sellers wanted to meet us in person before they signed purchase agreements. I've had this happen. 
Um, we've had issues where sellers have said, hey, what's your offer? Are the areas growing? I'm going to need top dollar, et cetera. These are just common objections, but these are ones that we can plan for. We've heard over and over. We're not going to get too many curveballs either. So all the only thing you have to do is just anticipate these questions and be able to answer them um, and have, uh, have your objections ready, okay, and be able to navigate around them. But like I said, if you're targeting the same demographic in each market, then they're going to have the same objections. They're going to have the same issues. If you're targeting absentee landlords like I do, people that are over 60 years old, you know, they're going to have the similar issues. So um, it's not like I have to, you know, change my systems for each market. Now, I may have to change what I do whenever I'm trying to file a contract, um, you know, working with a title company versus an attorney, depending on the state I'm in. Those are little nuances, but overall, the process does stay the same. So let's lastly go over some disadvantages and then I'll wrap all this up and tie it together and let you know my closing thoughts. So virtual wholesaling disadvantages is a few of them are you need to watch out for buyers going directly to sellers and behind your back. Uh, this is why I have a boots on the ground person that I send out and I pay every single time my buyer goes out. Because if the seller's there with the tenants, Guys, virtually, even if I know the buyer, you know, I tell the seller that it's a contractor. I tell the buyer, hey, to tell them that they're a contractor. I don't know what's going on in that conversation. I, I don't have anybody in that market. I may be hundreds of miles away. I may be hours away, right? I may be in South Carolina. I'm marketing the freaking Orlando, Florida. I don't know what's going on during that home inspection. And it can be stressful because I have had deals blow up in my face. I've had buyers um, literally get to the closing table and then my paralegal call me and tell me, hey, the seller backed out. I'm like, what? Yeah, it's because the buyer snaked me out of the deal. And it's one of the most hurtful and, you know, really shocking and surreal experiences when it happens to you the first time. But listen, we, uh, we pick ourselves up and we move on and we just take that experience and we move on and we don't play any games when we go forward. That's why I'm teaching you guys this, okay? Um, you need to stay on top of paralegals and closing timelines and updates. What I tell every single paralegal, our closing attorney, um, our title company, their assistants, is that as long as there's no personal information being um, transferred back and forth between the seller and buyer, guys, I need to be on all correspondence. No questions asked. I need to be on all correspondence, okay? I need to know what's happening in that transaction. Once you, especially if you're not using your own title company, if you're using the buyers guys, they could be saying stuff about to you, um, not sharing things with you, pushing closing timelines back, not calling the seller. I've had that happen because the title company is supposed to represent the seller and buyer in those closings. A lot of times if it's a buyer's closing attorney, I've had deals blow up in my face because the, the guys, basically the buyer's closing attorney was not keeping my seller in the loop. So that's why I like using my own closing it, our title company that I choose. Guys, your boots on the ground, people may flake. So overall, these are just logistical issues you need to be mindful of, okay, and get ahead of and put process in place. So as you can see, guys, you got to be really, really on top of your systems and processes when virtually wholesale. Guys, there is a high difficulty to master this stuff, especially if you're a new investor. I would say this, I would say new investors, unless you have <laughs> balls of steel <laughs> and you're really motivated to make this thing work, which, which you can, uh, you just need to know that virtually wholesaling may be very difficult. It might be, it might be better to wholesale a deal or two in your backyard or maybe even like an hour away from you where you can physically go to the property before you even think about virtually wholesaling. Okay, but if it was up to me and I had the plethora of information we have now that we have access to through YouTube, um, different courses on Instagram, TikTok and whatnot, people giving away great information, then I could have probably pieced it together myself back then. Um, but the information when I first started in 2015 was so limited, um, it was just very difficult to um, to learn virtually virtual wholesaling. I had to learn a lot of 
my information and my uh, my knowledge from virtual wholesaling would basically by failing, <laughs> you know, failing, 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 and then I learned. Okay, but it is a is a little bit difficult to master if you're a novice. I will say this. Another disadvantage is homeowners may want to do business in person. I put this here, although it's not that big of an issue now, it's still something that homeowners may say. I would say if a homeowner is adamant about doing person business in person, um, unless they're like really old, like 80 years old, and they don't have email and they want they want you to fax the contract <laughs> or something like that, guys, that seller is probably not really motivated and you're just going to go waste your time if you go see that property anyway. But after the pandemic, um, 2020, 2021, and 2022, guys, conducting Zoom and video conference calls are basically acceptable practices now. So trying to get a seller on FaceTime in 2019 or 2018 or 2017, guys, are due. We didn't have Zoom back then. We had a like go-to meeting in my early days of 2015 to 16. I'm trying to get a senior citizen or somebody in their 60s to do that was like, God, it was like rocket science for them. So um, now most of these people have done video conferences with their children, their kids, maybe taking some online classes. So guys, it's a lot easier to um, to do business over the phone or even set up a Zoom call to go over the contract. Uh, so that's one real advantage, I would say, even we're, though we're talking about disadvantages right now. I would say that's one real advantage from, um, from the pandemic. You know, I don't want to say sound like one of those people and say it was something good came out of it but i would say that's something that became uh, better for us in the wholesaling industry okay and it really helps with our closure rate so guys also um it's difficult to set up in-person meetings or just jump on opportunities immediately because you may lose deals to your competitors right so even if you're setting up an in-person meeting with a boots on the ground person uh, like they may be busy uh, or they may not just have the acquisition shops that you have to be able to just go out to the property and negotiate with the seller unless you have they're on the phone with you and they're talking to the seller which i've done that before but that's just really difficult guys um, and this leads me to my next point you really have to be good not great or i would say great not good rather at acquisitions and building rapport over the phone um the 16 personality types that are naturals at this are ESFJ, ENFJ, and ENTJs. Guys, I'm not discounting the other ones, but I would say these are the most natural fit for being able to communicate with sellers and lock up deals just naturally over the phone. I'll probably put ESTPs here as well because these are um, uh, your natural entrepreneurs, but uh, you know, it's very few personality types that are really naturally great. Just that building rapport over the phone and communicating with sellers virtually and locking up deals virtually and doing virtual acquisitions. That's why I would suggest even in your own backyard, once you close a couple of deals in your hometown, guys, start treating every deal like it's a virtual deal. Then if you have to go to the house, you can. But try locking it up over the phone without even going there. That's what I did to prep myself before I actually did virtual wholesaling back in 2017 and went into my first market. And that was Columbia, South Carolina, which is like an hour and a half away from Charleston. That's the uh, South Carolina state capital. And lastly, guys, um, you have a less of a pulse on the market. So what do I mean by that? You're just less involved and less up to date of what's going on in the local market, okay? And you get end up sounding a little tone deaf when you talk to these sellers. Um, like there could be a big storm or flood that came through and you could be cold calling when that happened. Guys, I call in Kansas City. What if I didn't hear, unfortunately, about the shooting that happened um, at the Super Bowl, um, uh, Super Bowl celebration that happened? OK, or what if I was just completely tone zoned out and tone deaf to what was going on in the news and media and i didn't know kansas city won the super bowl and that's something i could actually use to my advantage on the phone um you may not be as familiar with the crime ridden areas and the pockets of where crime are um, or uh, some, certain aspects of the market that are changing or have changed are in the process of being debated in town hall or city hall 
that could be affecting your lead flow or affecting why homeowners may not be selling. I wouldn't say this is a primary concern, but it definitely is something to be mindful of when you go on other markets. If you're just not great at doing all of the virtual stuff, meaning having your team in place, dealing with the logistics, having your operations in place, and you're not great on the phone, like this part of not having a post on the market is just going to further hinder you, right? It's not going to be the big issue that causes you not to have success, but it may just um, be one of those things that hinders you and and you may feel like you don't have it all together, okay? So guys, in conclusion, I would say for new wholesalers, definitely focus on wholesaling in your hometown first, um, but you should be thinking of, okay, how do I outsource each and every one of these tasks that I'm doing over and over and over again? And then not getting hooked on doing everything yourself and just because you can do something don't waste your time going to properties and viewing properties just because you can like when you start maybe to get the experience you could go out to these homes and uh, check them out but as real estate wholesalers guys one thing to know is that we do not look at houses just for the sake of it we actually are going to buy properties and there's a difference realtors look at houses wholesalers close so um that's one of the bigger advantages of advantages with hometown wholesaling in your backyard. But really, I think guys, after your first maybe five deals, you should really be looking at virtual wholesaling, even if your market's great for um, for wholesaling, even if it's a market most other people virtually wholesaling. I do think most established investors should have three or four markets that they're rotating out over the course of six months to a year, because at any point, anything to change, right? For instance, in 20, I think it was 2017, I was marketing to Houston and uh, Hurricane Harvey hit. And I had to wait on marketing to that area up until about two, maybe even three months after uh, that whole situation got sorted out because, it, you know, people were in a position to sell at that time. Now, it was a great place to be in after <laughs> those three, four months went by, but Directly after that hurricane, guys, it was not a great time to be calling sellers. So what if my whole business was hinged on marketing to homeowners in Houston, Texas? So it helps you hedge your bets. So guys, that's going to conclude this, uh, this lecture here. I hope you guys took a lot from this. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, at the link in the description. You can check out everything I have, all my services. I do offer consultation to investors. I help them get their businesses um, on track uh, in way of consultation. And I also do marketing. Um, I pull marketing lists and also do a couple other things. So check out what I have there for you. Um, I've been doing this for a while. I love working with wholesalers and investors, short-term rental investors, uh, you know, landlords as well uh, in the link in the description buildscalerealestate.com. I will chat with you guys later and see you guys in the next video. Happy wholesaling.